Welcome to Hashuka Hit. I would like to acknowledge the homeland of the Akwan, where we are holding today's talk. It is my pleasure to introduce Jana Sexton Atkins. Jana resides, or previously resided in Anchorage, Alaska. However, she is currently pursuing her master's in fine arts at the University of Idaho. In her exhibition, The Prayer Marker Series, Jana combines found and recycled objects with hand-drawn and sculpted elements. These mixed, mixed media assemblages contemplate society's connection to nature. Each of the artworks in the exhibition includes a portrait effigy of an insect, bird, fish, or plant. Sexton Atkins playfully combines these portraits with salvaged societal waste. The resulting markers encourage connection and responsibility to our planet. Prayer Markers Ecological Relics will be on exhibit through Saturday, April 8th. Jana, thank you for being here today to talk with us more about your work. Good evening. Oh, nice. Um, thank you for coming and uh, to see the exhibit and to come and hear me talk a little bit about um, sort of how I developed the prayer markers. And um, going forward, I would like to thank, uh, make sure I've got this. Okay. Um, I would like to thank, oh, I need my glasses. Hang on. <sighs> oh. All right, the Alaska State Museum staff, uh, Jackie Manning, the curator of exhibitions, the Friends of the Alaska State Library, Archives and Museum, and Ben Huff with Ice Fog Press for doing the, the catalog design. Sorry. Uh -huh. Oh, it just went into open its no. own little thing. There yeah. you go. Thanks. All right. Um, I've been intrigued with the bond between uh, plants and insects since the late 90s. At that time, I began to work as a master gardener for the municipality of Anchorage. Um, they have a city of flowers program. And then I went to the University of Alaska Anchorage grounds crew and worked for them and then ended up in working for Habitat for Humanity. They created a job for me um, to manage all of their landscaping projects um, for homes that they were building in Mountain View. So I was, it was a period from maybe 1997 to 2007 that I was working there and as it developed I was learning more about plants and the interaction and <clears throat> my work uh, is um, fueled by personal observations field encounters and investigative research and between the three uh, I create works in response Little challenged here, but okay. Uh, large urban land projects provide daily opportunities to observe and engage with nature's natural processes. I'm a little challenged here. I'm not, well, I'm not sure why, but oh well. Um, okay. Um, the encounters that I have and uh, lead me to researching um, interactions in nature and that result, uh, those resulting uh, combinations inspire the mixed media, first started with inspiring me to do mixed media portraits um, and then led to some skeletal relief uh, the first exhibit I had of those portraits was uh, uh, called Relics, and it was at the Gary Freeberg Gallery at the Kenai Peninsula College in 2001. The, uh, this is, um, at that time I was mainly just interested in diversity 
and interesting stories. And uh, this was a fish that I had researched that was um, uh, pretty interesting in how it looked, and so it inspired me to do a large portrait. Would that be a very deep? Yes. Were you down there? No. <laughs> But I was so intrigued, you know, by um, the, how diverse uh, we were. And then, um, having lived in Alaska since I was a kid, um, I had never experienced cicadas. And then I uh, was doing research on insects, and uh, so I developed a portrait about the cicada, uh, colored pencil, powdered pigment on recycled pa panel. But. Uh, with reports of the colony collapse disorder in 2006, uh, my, urb my urban ecological restoration projects and studio, studio work expanded to support the missing. It was very upsetting to me that, um, and to everybody, I think, when that happened. Uh, it was linked uh, pretty quickly. It was linked to pesticides, mono agricultural, uh, monocultural agriculture, and fragmented habit habitats. And this is from my garden. These are Valer um, uh, very bee friendly, and um, you can see they get very large. And I, I'm really uh, very fond of spiky plants um, and um, who, who reproduce themselves, and the, uh, they spread very well. I want to say valerian, but that's not correct. Um, um, I, I think I'll move on because it'll come to me as I think about it. Um, insects and songbird activity swiftly d dwindled in my urban gar um, garden beds. I mean, it was like as soon as they reported it, it was like almost instantly, like within a year or two, uh, I saw a drastic drop in my in activity in my garden beds. Uh, multiple severe global developments began to unfold all at once everywhere, and everybody is experiencing this, and you, I know that you can relate. So um, I began to respond to the forest fires, and this piece is um, seven feet long by three feet high. It's a mixed media on um, recycled panel, and um, it's uh, in the pro it's in process. I'm still working on it because the raised surface process is very um, time consuming, and uh, takes a while to build up the surfaces. It's a multi layering process, and so I layer up and then I let it dry and harden and then come back and do carving, it's uh, carving on it, and um, and then I started, and it's, you know, it starts off as a drawing, and you'll see on the far uh, left, uh, the drawing, some of the drawing is still left, and, um, and then the drawing isn't satisfying enough, so I um, start raising surfaces, and uh, so this one is still in progress, and is uh, getting ready, I think, to go into a show about fire in uh, northern Idaho. Then, um, so that was 2000, and uh, in 2011, uh, an invasive, invasive species became a reality. And that was when uh, a large flock of non-indigenous European starlings arrived in Anchorage, Alaska. I was driving down the road, and I saw these black saw, you know, birds, and a, a, a large flock of them, and I went, whoa, what are those, you know? And upon researching and everything, it came, uh, it, I identified them as European starlings. Um, in response to that, I created this piece, which is about seven feet long and about three feet high. I really like a long, narrow format. You'll see a lot of my work is kind of like that here. Um, and this is a, um, it's called Flock, and it's in the collection of the Kenai Visitors and uh, Cultural Center in Kenai, Alaska. And uh, so in uh, probably 1890s, early 1890s, um, a flock of about 100 European starlings were um, originally introduced to Central Park. 
And there's, I've seen various stories about that. Um, and I'm not really sure, I haven't cut, quite nailed it down exactly who did that, but uh, that flock has multiplied to 200 million and has spread clear across the US and Canada. And in 2011, they, had, they arrived in Anchorage and they're there to stay. So what's um, sort of troubling about the starlings, I love them, but um, they travel in large flocks of 500 to 600 and frequently use nest cavities um, excavated by woodpeckers and other small indigenous birds and they drive them out of the nest and use their nests for their own children. Um, they are um, actually cited as the cause for the decline of the eastern bluebird. So it, it's a troubling thing, um, but this is sort of a reality that is for the state of Alaska. <clears throat> There's been rapid ecological devastation, everyone, deterioration. Um, it's Pretty much, I think we're in agreement. Um, some of the things that are going on is the sustained warmth, um, the changes in biodiversity, accumulation of toxic substances, sea ice loss, coastal flooding, river flooding, deforestation, and drought. This uh, piece that's in the gallery that you saw tonight is Arctic heat weight. And it, um, it was completed in 2023 for this exhibit, but it, is in, it responds to um, the um, sustained warmth that the Arctic is experiencing and the loss of biodiversity and issues with uh, diversity. In 2010, uh, I ha had moved away from the portraits and or covered the portraits uh, with um, raised surfaces. So under a number of these pieces there is the color, the original color pencil drawing. As I said, not satisfied. So I expanded on them uh, because I needed to see the skeleton. The skeleton became a symbol for me of uh, uh, the loss that we were all experiencing. So um, this exhibit uh, um, consisted of ghost skeletal re relief um, I'm very fascinated with venation and texture to tell the story of the loss. These are some of the examples of the um, plants that I had, as I was saying, I became a master gardener. I'm fascinated with plant diversity. And I was running into these plants in Anchorage that are non-indigenous. And they are part of the landscape um, industry that plants plants from China. So the skeleton, leaf skeleton in the center is the legal area, and I'm sure maybe some of you have them in your garden. They're beautiful plants. Um, and uh, the uh, leaf on the left is the black oak which uh, came to Anchorage, and with the black oak came a blight. They came in the specimens, um, and you would see black knot. And black knot is a very highly contagious fungus that spreads and puts large knots on the trees, and you'll see them throughout Anchorage. And, uh, and then the one, which is absolutely my favorite, is the uh, verbascum. Oh, by the way, the plant with the, the tall spiky plant was Verbascum, <laughs> but there's many variations of it. But this one, the city of um, Anchorage itself planted every year, and the leaves are enormous, and they're soft and very gray. They're so beautiful, and the venation on them is um, just wonderful. And so I, was, I you know, it started with colored pencil drawings, but then it just wasn't enough. I had to raise the surfaces to bring up that venation. And so that's, um, this is part of the ghost markers um, uh, exhibit. And getting in a little bit closer, you can kind of get, see the texture and the roughness. I, for some reason, I don't, I couldn't even explain it. Yes. Can you ask questions? Sure. 
Yeah, everybody asks me that, so it's a secret formula. Oh, yeah, no, <laughs> it's a secret formula. I'd have to kill you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, it's a combination. Sometimes it, I, it varies. Sometimes I use paper and I pulp it, and then I mix in some, um, uh, what's that stuff you use on the walls? Sheet rock. Yeah, yeah. And, or um, modeling paste um, and stuff like that. Um, and it varies a little bit, but it, it, what I do is I, it gets a little soupy and I have a uh, stick and I pull it out and then I drip it onto the surface. And then um, I let it harden and then I carve back on it. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a long process. And um, so, but I just, I'm, you know, I'm enamored of the process and obviously because you see it in the gallery and it's grown. These are early pieces that you're looking at here. Now, I also do photography. So any of the photography you see in this um, presentation is mine and it's part of my research. I take walks, get out in the garden, in my garden. Uh, I set up large urban projects where I invite the, uh, the bees to come in. And this is a hoverfly. It is not a bee. It's a hoverfly, but it is a pollinator. And they are very small, and they uh, are very fast, and they act like hummingbirds. They can, you know how a hummingbird will stand in mid-flight, and, and they're just so charming, and I love them so much. And Anchorage has a large population of hoverflies. If you plant, they will come. So um, for me, I, this is where I s started to develop a philosophy and, and the Ahimsa precept of all living beings have the spark of divine spiritual energy. And it's what I believe. And I think it's, um, and so that's my uh, Icelandic poppy in my garden and the hoverfly. And uh, I have really uh, come to the conclusion that everyone must contribute to fight the age of extinction with the resources they have. Whatever you have, whatever you think you can do in your home, in your garden. Um, and I put Morgan Freeman in here very well-known actor, but he did something really interesting. Uh, he was concerned about the bees, and so he converted his 124-acre Mississippi ranch into a bee refuge. Uh, he hired gardeners, filled acres with clover, planted hundreds of flowering trees, and purchased 26 hives and turned himself into a beekeeper. <laughs> so he took his resources and made a, a statement for, for the nature, and he's, I, I really admire that, you know, and that's what I have done. I have taken my, what resources I have and um, am making some kind of a um, statement for, or, you know, a, a refuge for biodiversity. I advocate for the rights of all living organisms to have autonomy and sustainable organic habitat. I believe every life form serves a unique purpose. And so I show you wasps because they are scary and they are dangerous, <laughs> but they have a unique purpose. They are hunters. They eat the caterpillars. They eat the aphids. They are um, set up their nests. If they see a tree with an aphid on it, you will find a nest somewhere close by because they are feeding their young, those aphids. And um, I had raspberries one year and so many white moths, little pesky critters, right? And uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> I just did, I didn't want to use pesticides because you know that the pesticides kill everything. And so I was sitting there fretting and fretting and one day I went out there and there were wasps all over the raspberries. They were hunting. You know, so um, I would say 
that um, it's important to understand that every living being on the planet has some real purpose here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about exclusive uh, because uh, what exclusive is is that a species is confined completely or almost completely to a particular community. So an example of that would be, uh, and this I was this is early research. I was just really fascinated with this moth that had this long tongue and uh, very long, uh, 18 to 14 inches. And um, Darwin saw it on Madagascar, and he, uh, he actually saw the, the flower, and he predicted that there was a pollinator for that particular flower. And after his death, um, uh, they actually discovered the Sphinx hawk moth. And I had to draw a picture of that. I had to bring that forth so I could get the feeling of how long the tongue was of that particular species. And uh, so I did this. This is, has not been raised. This is just the original uh, colored pencil drawing. And at first I showed, I uh, exhibited it as just the drawing with the blue background, the blue-green background. And then later I came back and did the flowers about, I don't know, six or seven years later. Uh, and that's one thing, that's how I work. I start one project or I do a drawing, I have an exhibit, it doesn't sell, it comes back to my studio, and I do more. It, it grows, it, and that's part of my process. And I pulled a picture uh, to show you one of the moth, the moth, the sphinx moth, and the, um, the flower, the orchid. And what's interesting is that they're exclusive to each other. Without one, you don't have the other. And in nature, and I'm sure you know this, that this is quite common, right? Now, fens or wetlands, fens are peat-forming wetlands that rely on groundwater input and require thousands of years to develop. They cannot be easily um, restored once destroyed. And, and they are home to rare plants, <clears throat> insects, and small mammals. <clears throat> Quite a diverse, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And <clears throat> so I have several pieces in the exhibit that talk about the wetlands, the shrine to the wetland habitat, and wake for the wetlands because uh, so many of the wetlands are being removed. So I, wanted to share one story of, um, of an exclusive um, partnership between the Ami borer moth, or it's also known as a small white aster moth. These are common names, by the way. And um, their larvae bore into the stems and the rhizomes of the bog bean plant in rich peatland habitats. And I don't know if you've ever seen these, but they're uh, common to Alaska, both the plant and the moth. I've seen them in Idaho, in my backyard. They're all throughout North America in our wetlands. Uh, I had an interesting encounter on the um, Alaska MV Kennecott Ferry as I was leaving in 2021 to go to Idaho to start my master's program. I, there was a young man, uh, maybe in his early 30s, and um, he was leaving the state on the same ferry, and he sat in the dining room of the ferry for the entire five-day journey uh, all day long. He was there right after breakfast until dinner time, and he was mounting butterfly specimens he had collected from Cold Bay, Alaska. And in that, uh, in that encounter, I witnessed eight large tubs full of butterflies. And I was shocked. Uh, and it was, it was meant for me to see that encounter. And the more I thought about it, I didn't, I didn't know what to think about it except that I felt for every one of those butterflies. Sorry, I'm too emotional about butterflies. But 
<clears throat> I started this piece. Uh, it's colored pencil, and there's no raised surfaces here because for me, the colored pencil is enough. And they're small, but they're uniform because it's not talking about a collection. It's talking about the souls of the collected. It's a memento mori for those butterflies that he took from the state of Alaska to go back for his fellowship at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Um, a really nice guy. And one thing, if you know anything about entomology, they're required to collect and they're required to set up their own personal collections. This is every entomologist on the planet. And if you think, I started doing research about collections. And every museum and every university has their own collection of insects. And the Smithsonian itself has almost 200 million butterflies in their collection. So it got me thinking about, wow, do we need to collect any more? How much, how many butterflies do we need in our collections? And it just made me question that. So that's, I started that piece. And then uh, the other night uh, when I was preparing this presentation, um, I came across butterflying. And I went, hey, that's kind of interesting. Um, and uh, uh, there's been a rise of this uh, thing called butterflying. And uh, it's kind of like bird watching. Um, it involves identifying and capturing photography of the insects um, instead of capturing, enslaving, or exterminating them. Now, uh, to exterminate the butterflies, they use vials of alcohol, cyanide bricks, metal pens, jars, and of course the butterfly net. Now, it just raised an ethical question for me. And I don't know what the answer is, but I've been butterflying for quite a while, <laughs> you know? I have been, this is a moth. Now this, I, I found out about this plant, it's called the Budalea, and there's some controversy about it. It's evasive. If you plant it, it supposedly it takes off and spreads everywhere. And also, it doesn't really provide habitat. It only provides nectar. So the butterflies don't really lay their, you know, their eggs and raise their young in those, this plant, but they love it. So I bought one last summer um, uh, when I was restoring the front yard of this house that I'm renting in, in um, Idaho to do an experimental garden again, set up the urban uh, thing. And uh, I got this Budalea plant and I left it in a pot because I, I don't want to spread it or anything, you know, the evasive thing is it's controversial, you know, but um, But oh I had hummingbirds I had two or three species of butterflies show up two or three days in a row They all came they loved the plant and I thought wow, this is really cool, you know, so the, and and I got some really great photography now I do straight photography and I did that with the uh, hoverfly, um, but um, I also get into Photoshop and and mess around and, and try to uh, do accentu uh, accentuating, eliminating details and kind of breaking the shapes down so it would be like easier to read the painting and it looks more like a painting. This way I don't have to paint. <laughs> I can still work on raised surfaces, but I get to feel like I'm painting, right? So anyway, so that's sort of part of my process. I do research. This is part of the research that I do. And sometimes I take it further, and other times I just enjoy the photos in my butterflying experiences. Um, I consider myself to be a botanical steward of my urban environment. So what surrounds me? And one thing I did when I went to Idaho, um, the front lawn students, it's a community, it's a university community, and students have been parking up on the lawn. And so I asked my, uh, the people I rent from if I could, you know, uh, restore the lawn with a garden. And they said yes. So I took back the yard and, um, and then I found out that Idaho has like this heavy clay soil. So I didn't know what to do with that. I had to research about that. And um, uh, I 
so I collaborate with nature with urban projects. I call those my urban projects. And uh, build, I build organic habitat. I'm crazy about germination and sprouting plants and um, cultivating those plants and uh, picking up the action, pollination, songbirds, rabbits, quail, whatever comes in the yard. I'm just thrilled, squirrels. And uh, the cultivation also includes understanding what you're planting and making sure that if you do plant an invasive species, you can do things like deadhead them before they go to seed and spread. You know, you can do things like that. That's responsible. Um, but in Alaska, it's not such a big deal because it's so cold that things don't repeat themselves, you know? So you can do things like plant the foxglove, but in Colorado, the foxglove has become evasive. And it's a European plant that was brought into people's gardens. They're charming, they're lovely, and the bees love them. But in Colorado, they've spread all over and they're just growing wild now down the highways and stuff like that. So that's, in the lower 48, there's more problems with the evasive end of it. So, um, but up here, we, we, especially in Anchorage, I could just plant the foxglove and they never went anywhere, right? Uh, I would have to plant them again the next year. It's just too cold. So, this, uh, I facilitate a healing place for refuge and sanctuary. So, this little bee came into my yard and he was exhausted. And I thought he was dying. And then I did some research and it said, oh, you can like provide sugar water. I went, so I got out my little eye dropping. <laughs> I went over and I laid, and he was, I had him in my living room in the window and I dropped some sugar water there and made sure his little face got in it a little bit and nothing happened. I don't know, 40 minutes later, uh, I added a little more and then all of a sudden, uh, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 minutes later, uh, I heard this, you know how bees sound, you know? He was like angry, he wanted to get out, he was hitting my window. And I went, yeah, and so I let him out. And he went on his merry way. Um, they have a wide range. So um, he went home, you know, he had gotten out. And I, that was really exciting for me and he was so beautiful. <clears throat> this is um, the verbascum, and uh, there's foxglove here, and, uh, and lilies. I plant other things, but lately I'm really getting ruthless about it. I'm not, I really am starting to think it has to be, everything has to be for pollinators because the situation has gotten so dire. Um, so it's action. That's what it takes from everybody. It isn't that you let the government take care of it or anybody else. You take action. Even if you're in an apartment, if you plant a potted plant on your porch and put a sunflower on there, you're going to encourage pollination. They send scouts out. They look. They came by my garden. I think they identify plants. I think they know where they are. They come back. and. Uh, and uh, so uh, my actions, my ecological actions, plant diverse, supportive habitat to transform my urban environment, to create biodiversity encounters. I provide refuge and sanctuary. So uh, songbirds need shrubs. They need the shrubs. So any kind of shrub, and if you can combine it with some kind of pollination, even the better. Um, good soil is critical. And, uh, and then the deadheading, which is uh, taking the seeds off, uh, the plant seeds before they actually develop, if you don't want things to spread. Um, so pollinators and songbirds are the, my main focus, but uh, I love a party, so I uh, am happy to see other um, wildlife show up. This is a songbird reliquary. Um, 
and I will show you several pieces that aren't in this show but are a part of the prayer marker series and that's one of them. Um, I fight for extinction you know I fight to uh, what I can do and so part of that is I work in my gardens but I also build the relics that you have seen tonight in the gallery to touch your heart and, <clears throat> and bring you, um, have you, give you a moment to contemplate where you are at and what you feel about um, pollinators, the planet, and uh, the biodiversity that it, I feel is so important. For our, san for our sanity, I think. I, I uh, recognize very early on that I don't want a planet with just humans. I need the birds. I need the bees. I need to go down the road and see a moose. <laughs> you know, a fox, a lynx. All of those things are so exciting. And I think Alaskans are on the same page about that. Regenerate your habitat naturally. This one was photoshopped, enhanced, <laughs> but it was fun. I have the purple was really fun. <laughs> so, but um, my garden again. So the hard lesson I had this past summer in Idaho was that the bees really don't like the snaps. They just don't want to go in. I read that they do, but I have never seen the bees actually use the snapdragons for pollination. And if somebody has, send me a picture because I watch the bees, two, three different species come in to my garden in Idaho. Uh, my, it's an experimental garden for my masters, but part of the, the relics and everything. But um, so next year, unfortunately, I won't be putting in snaps because I'm going to get more uh, focused on just pollination to see if I can get even more activity. And uh, so I would highly recommend that you resist the use of chemicals, herbicides and pesticides. Fertilizer's a little tricky, but, um, but if you can do natural fertilizing, uh, good, um, but definitely no herbicides and pesticides. Uh, Chemical-free habitat promotes soil-healthy microbes and decomposers and roots. So the decomposers, of course, are the beetles, the worms, you know. Uh, all of the, the decomposers clean up the forests, and um, <clears throat> it's very critical for them to not have chemicals in the soil for health. Um, an interesting thing I just ran into um, this past year uh, was an article, and I've put the, uh, the site for the article, and it was on weeds. And this um, student out of Florida, this graduate student, did a study of two separate or orchards. Uh, one, they cleaned up and left no weeds, and in the other orchard, they left all the weeds. And what was really interesting it was that the orchard that, where the weeds were, the, the fruit yield was like hugely larger than the other one. And um, so it's a really interesting read. You might want to read that article, take a photo with your camera and uh, look up this site. Uh, it was. Uh, fascinating to me and it inspired me to do several pieces and I'm in the process of getting ready in my next body of work I think to do more on weeds. Uh, they pr weeds protect and restore the soils. They provide critical habitat for beneficial organisms, insects and animals and as I said increase crop yields. And one of the things is is that when the orchards uh, they bring in um, pollinators, but
but once it's over, they don't, you know, they leave. So they engage the pollinator activity for longer periods of time. And uh, this is a picture that I took of dandelions and then enhanced in Photoshop. But, oops, sorry. Um, but that, um, the message uh, that I have is let nature take its natural course of action. And I talked a little bit about that when I told you about the wasps in my showing up to eat the caterpillars. I had another interesting experience where, I don't know if you've ever seen the crab um, spider, but it's a large white spider that has kind of pink sides and it's a little bit of yellow. And uh, before I left Anchorage, uh, these white moths, there's something, they like me or something, they show up a lot. And maybe they show up in your garden too, but uh, they decided to park themselves in my shrubs, my uh, Sitka roses and my Kim lilac every year. And I, I was fretting and fretting, oh, I gotta get rid of those guys. And um, I went out there one day, and there was all these, these spiders. And they, were, they had a territory. And they were spaced out through the whole shrubs, all three of the shrubs. And they were all, uh, they were hunting. And I went, oh. And I was, went, great. I don't have to do anything. And I walked away. Let nature take its natural course of action. It's a balance, right? So uh, the pesticides and herbicides devastate every kind of organism it comes in contact with. So this piece, um, the herbicidal deconstruct, is basically trying to express that uh, by killing the weeds, uh, you know, you're taking a course of action that affects you and the soil and with the decomposer and in the symbolism here. Oops, we're going, we're going forward. All right, um, my feeling about the prayer markers, the ecological relics, is um, to encourage a deeper empathetic connection with the audience towards all life forms. Um, the individual portraits that I do um, are to bring healing essence from nature into the gallery and to hopefully expand your appreciation as an audience for Earth's biodiversity as being powerful healing medicine, as it is to me. When I get in my garden, it's the best. And as a gardener, I'm sure um, many of you are gardeners, um, you know what I'm talking about. Or maybe just a walk in the park, down a hiking trail, um, sit in your favorite spot and meditate and just listen to the birds. And that's sort of why I make them to encourage the audience to think about those things. In the urban space, in the urban gallery, to remind you that these things are critical for your mental health as well as mine. So part of my process is that I uh, do the portraits, I do the research, I do the observations, I do the gardens, but I also am a collector of man-made objects and natural objects so that I can tell the stories related to environmental issues. So I come across the most interesting stuff <laughs> in garbage cans, people's alleyways, uh, and um, uh, they're usually one of a kind, but they're usually like remnants from mass production, but they got broken. Somebody doesn't like a broken piece or a thing, so they, you know, throw it out or donate it or whatever. And I come across them and I repair them, and they seem to fit perfectly with my messaging and what I'm trying to talk about. And this one, when I made this piece, I just laughed. It was so much fun to make this piece because here were these Franciscan monks, right, carved out of wood for tourist industry. And, uh, and then I thought, oh my gosh, they're perfect for the frog, you know, for the wetlands. And so combining those things really gets me um, fun, but yet also 
uh, has a direct message about the wetlands. This uh, wetlands uh, photograph was taken in Anchorage and one of the lakes, Anchorage has a number of lakes, and I was working on a job uh, as a landscaper. And um, we were doing something on the, uh, for a client and I went and th their place was right on a lake, right in Midtown Anchorage. And I went down there and I started looking around and it was full of um, mayflies and um, irises were blooming and it was just so beautiful. And I just spent probably about 45 minutes just taking photos. And I got this photo, isn't it great? I mean, it's just a perfect photo of water. And um, it started to rain. And so, but that goes back to the discussion of the fens, you know, the wetlands and how important they are for biodiversity. Um, I also don't, it's not enough, and I have holes when I make the pieces. Uh, there's like something missing. And so when I got to the University of Idaho, uh, all of a sudden I started, I, w I got some porcelain, and I started making these effigies, these little bees and, and things, and it, they just fit. And all of a sudden pieces I couldn't resolve just went click, and I had the resolution. And they also tie into the ghosts because they're white. And that's why you'll see white effigies in the gallery because for me, that's the symbolism of the missing and the white. Um, uh, and then uh, here's an example of how objects come to me. So I see this beautiful wood carving and uh, it's a small table and it's from India, and it's part of their industry that they do to, you know, support themselves. A beautiful thing, it's beautiful, right? And so I started thinking, man, if somebody uses that as a table, they're gonna leave it outside, it might get warped, you know, it needs to be preserved. And so I put it, laid it down, and it had a center, and then I did this, and then I said, what is the rosewood? Because I didn't know very much about rosewood. And I went online, I started reading about it, and it's actually endangered. And then I was like, wow, this is so perfect, you know? Um, it fits with the, the messaging, and, um, and also it preserves this piece of rosewood, you know? So that's sort of one thing that I do that, so I'll cl create the clay forms or the wood form. So I carve this woman on the right and this is the um, keening oscillations of Mother Earth. And um, uh, I did the woman and she was had a flat head. You know, there's a like, I didn't like do the head part. And I, at first I had a rock in it. And when I first showed her, she had a rock. But then along came this beautiful little carving that I found of um, this hummingbird. And one day I was sitting there and I put the hummingbird on top of the woman's head and I went, oh, perfect, <laughs> right? And, um, and then I found the little altar form and the cast iron rivet thing. And it all kind of came together. But what really was, I could not think of a title because I, I knew it was working. But uh, so I, uh, I was watching that movie from the 80s of the last Chinese emperor. I can't remember the name of that movie. But then I went on and I started reading about the last emperor of China because I realized I didn't know anything about him. And I went along and it was talking about, it was really a terrible thing that happened to him and his wife, and uh, she, they were taken over by the Japanese and then eventually, you know, how China went. But, um, but the, his wife and him finally split up, but her child died. And when her child died, they used the word keening. And I went, what does that word mean? And I went and looked it up, and it's the screaming cries of a mother. And I went, oh, perfect. That's our planet right now. You know, that, that's how I felt about it. So that's kind of how that came about. And that's 
sort of the stories and how these pieces come together. There are bits and pieces through research, curiosity, wanting to know, and, um, and then finding these objects that match things that I'm creating. So the Keening woman, the woman I carved, and she's basswood, and then the, um, the uh, hummingbird is unknown, the artist is unknown. But if he ever shows up or she shows up, I will definitely credit her. You know what I'm saying? I'm not trying to, uh, you know, claim it as my own, but I know that it works together. So uh, the wild rosewood lament is the sadness about the tree itself, and then, uh, and then the keening oscillations of our of our own planet. My processes. Each prayer marker goes through massive change. They're laid out throughout in my studio. Uh, I have a room right now that's, I have like 10 or 15 of them on the floor, and they change depending on what I find, how I'm thinking, where I'm going with the ideas. This one is not in the show. It needed repair, and so I um, unfortunately didn't get to that. But um, it started with the wooden candlesticks that I found, and they were so beautiful, so I wanted to preserve them. I didn't want anybody to use them as candlesticks anymore because uh, they were so beautifully carved. And then I thought, oh, perfect, I'll do a little altar. Oh, I put the thing on there, and it was totally level. And I went, yay, no more work there. And then I moved on, and I found the panel uh, with the um, uh, pattern on it, then came along and they combined. And then uh, a drawing that I had done for the portraits shows at the very beginning uh, that was a beetle, an endangered beetle um, portrait. And I, the color pencils just, it just wasn't enough. So I started uh, raising the surfaces on it. And, uh, and then the angel showed up and the little hummingbird and I combined those. And I thought, the angel was so beautiful. And uh, probably 1960s, I don't know. And then the earthquake happened in 2018. <laughs> Anchorage, my whole house went crazy. And uh, all the prayer markers and were, you know, that I was designing were jumping around and everything. And so the angel got a hole in its leg. And I thought, OK, that's part of the title. <laughs> you know. Uh, and I didn't try to repair it or anything. But um, it eventually, it ended up. Um, and this was the piece. And uh, the beetle itself is um, endangered. And it is uh, from South America. I'm sorry I didn't put the title of this piece in. I, I just missed getting that going. But, um, but uh, the square um, jasper cube. So the symbolism in uh, Renaissance uh, uh, art is the square is planet Earth, or the physical life we're living in, and the circle is um, heaven or the spirit. And so the combination of the two, uh, Leonardo da Vinci did the circle and uh, the square and the circle and the Vitruvian man piece. And so it's sort of a take on that. And so the angel is above the, the Earth and uh, telling you, hmm, think about things, you know. And it just sort of felt, and then I found this little piece of wood with the circles, and I put that in behind, and then it needed paintings. So I painted in the little flowers and stuff. So it's a process that goes along in many steps and uh, combinations of drawings from the past as well as found objects. Um, this one is in the gallery, and uh, this one is You as My Brother. Yeah, I f it was another combination. You can see several versions as I'm moving through. So the butterfly, I started back in the 70s when I was a up in Fairbanks. And that drawing kind of kicked around with me up until this piece. And then the feather, um, I was in Yosemite National Park in the early 70s with my boyfriend. And um, I found that feather. And I did a drawing of it. 
the ravens I saw in Anchorage, Alaska one day, they were sitting and they were talking to each other and I kind of have a photographic memory and I went home. I didn't take a photo, I just went home and drew them. And, uh, they, and it, you'll see their panels. So then I take the panels and then I start combining the panels. And uh, I threw the owl in and took the owl out. He stayed in for a while, but then I found the chickadee. <laughs> and the chickadee is a mass-produced painting. And I think the artist's name is on there. It's commercially produced. And I just loved it so much. So I stuck and then it sort of came and came together. Now, the coupe de gras was the panel. You is my brother. And it said, you is my brother flew further the rocks skip farther, and the stars don't seem so far away. And it sort of expresses my sentiment about the ravens in this town. They were bringing me so much joy. I haven't seen a raven since I left Anchorage <laughs> for two years. I think I've like, been crying. I'm so glad to see them. And uh, that's sort of, uh, uh, so when I found that panel, it was just perfect. And it topped it all off. And... Uh, pieces was really fun to build and then I'll share one more with you of how it came together and that's the tribute to eroding commonalities and I was I went through a series of just sitting sometimes I just like to sit in my bed and draw and I decided to uh, challenge myself to do skeleton uh, um, of bird heads and um, so this is a robin skull and then the tree itself is a piece of jewelry. And I, it was so beautiful, mass produced, but I had not seen one anywhere else. So I wanted to preserve it. And then I found this piece of scrap wood. It was two pieces and I glued them together and the tree fit, fit perfectly. And then I have this little necklace of bird bones. And so I got those out and I was like drawing those and everything just sort of kind of fell together. In a, so you've got the graphite drawing, the found object of the, um, the tree, and then the skeleton. Just talking about how common the robin is, but how sad life would be without them. You know? So, and you can see it went through several versions. It actually went through about five or six, but I'm just showing you uh, several. And also the background changed. <laughs> You know, I decided I didn't like the turquoise. And I started with the map of the Arctic and then, yeah, and some watercolor, um, um, abstract watercolor things. And, but, you know, and then I found the, the root base, but I put that into another piece. I took that out and I've got that going in another piece. And then it came to this. And that's sort of some of the steps. Like I said, sometimes I do 15, 20 versions. That's the most fun. I just want, for me, the best time in my studio is when I can go through and mix and match, mix and match, mix and match. And I get such great results in terms of when I do that, I get like these wonderful combinations. This piece took me probably 10 years because I could not get the, everything to balance. But finally I did, and I call this Northern Light Reflections of Gen Genetic Diversity. And this is really about the Boreal Forest. And I encourage you to do purposeful ecological action in your urban environment, because it really does make a difference. And such a difference that it was so wonderful um, that this article showed up. Uh, I was doing a lot of ecology research. I was taking an ecology and art class um, at U Idaho. And in doing my paper and my presentation for that, uh, I came across this article by Marinelli, Janet Marinelli, called Urban Refuge, How Cities Can Help Solve the Biodiversity Crisis. And this is a great article because what they found in COVID uh, when people stopped moving around is that the animals came back to the cities. So Central Park in New York City had a coyote move in to a cave somewhere in that park. 
and uh, some kind of a, a, a hawk that hadn't been, or a hawk, or I think it was a hawk, ha, well, hadn't been seen in years, moved in. And this is, a, this is a picture from her article. A sea lion on the sidewalk of Mar del Pia, 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 sorry, Plata, Argentina, showed up. And what scientists have, it started making scientists, this is around the world, this happened. Reports were coming in all over. And uh, what, what it, the ecologists are starting to reconsider the urban environment. They had written it off. Ugh, it's a mess. No, never. You know, and now they're like going, oh, wait a minute. Maybe we don't quite get it. And it's interesting because this past summer I was downtown Moscow. It's a small little town, but right on, and they, they had this eaves thing, sort of a decorative thing, and there were all these sparrows. And they were just busy and making lots of noise. They had made their nests there, and that's what they're finding. They're finding that if you build it, they will come. And that's really the message uh, that I have for you tonight. And, um, and thank you so much uh, for listening to my story and, uh, and for coming to my opening. And I'm ready to take questions if you have any. <laughs> thank you. I think I am, but I do love drawing. I draw and and I sculpt. I love to paint, but I if I have my druthers, it's what, what you put together and how it comes out is magic. I think. Oh, really, really good. I, I I appreciate that, but what I really appreciate is that you get it. It touches you, and when I first exhibited the first. Um, part of these was in 2019 at the International Gallery in Anchorage, Alaska. I was shocked because I had originally just made these for myself, really. Um, and um, the response was overwhelming. I was like, whoa, you know, I had people coming up. Um, I had Alvin Amoson, I don't know if you know him. Um, he comes up and he goes, I want to introduce myself to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, an, oh my God, <laughs> I was so, I, I, you know, and that was a really big honor for me. And um, so what's been the most satisfying thing is how the, the audience you has responded. So thank you very much. Yeah. Yes? A while back you had a picture of a garden. Was that a garden that was that, from the parking lot the no, parking that's lot. my garden at my, that's my Anchorage garden. I have a kind of a triplex, and the guy I bought the place from, he was from, I, I, it was the original owner, and it went through the 64 earthquake, so it's got foundation problems, and, and he hated grass, and he hated lawns, and he tried to pave the entire property. There's like 3,000 square feet of asphalt on that thing. But I reclaimed every piece of dirt that I could find on that thing, and that was one of the beds that, yeah. So, and it, and I just had a, I just can't tell you how much pollinator activity I had in there. It, it was just crazy. But what blew me away was Idaho, the bed I put in in Idaho. I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I decided I wanted the songbirds. I had to have the songbirds. So I got a little shallow dish and I put it out in the front yard and I went, okay, they'll come for the water. And um, these wasps showed up and they come in, they land and they drink and then they take off. And pretty soon it was wasps all day long. And I, w I went, oh my God, <laughs> you know, cause they're scary, you know? And I thought they were yellow jackets. I, I don't know. I, I'm still learning the region. Um, but um, so I said, okay, just relax, let the process do itself, you know? And so then, I don't know, about seven days later, I'm in my kitchen and I have like a backyard and, and I hear, I feel a vibration. And, I'm, and it's in my ears and, and it's vibrating. And I'm like, what the heck is that? Mm, something like that. 
And I look and I step out and the whole backyard is full of wasps and they're all facing the hillside. And there were probably three, I think the whole nest showed up, I swear. And I was like going, I was freaking out because my neighbors, <laughs> I'm in a duplex and I was like, oh my God, somebody's gonna get stung. And I walked out there and I say, what are you guys doing here? And I was talking to them and they were all mm, and uh, really excited. I, it was crazy. And um, after about three days of it, I said, I was afraid they were building a nest. That's what I was really afraid of, because I have rock, craggy rocks and all this stuff. And I don't know the region that well, right? I've been in Alaska since I was a kid. And <laughs> so I called the, the, the pesticide guy, and um, he came by, and we talked for three hours. <laughs> and he filled me in. They weren't yellow jackets. They were some kind of wasp. And they weren't building a nest because they do that early on. And they, he goes, oh, he goes, they're eating mites. So on this, this ground-covered plant, there were all these mites. He said, it's like candy. It's like picking candy. They just are in there going crazy. And if I spray it with pyrithium herbicide, it's, he said it was based in plant, plant-based, the pyrithium daisy, right? He said, if you plant, if I spray that, you're going to lose all the activity, no, no biodiversity whatsoever. And I said, well, I don't want that. You know, so we had a great talk. And then he, he said, well, just let me know. And I hope no, bye. And um, so then I got online. I started reading about it. And I go, okay, because I was worried about my neighbors, you know, a little bit. And um, it said, uh, to get rid of wasps, you take peppermint oil and uh, peppermint oil concentrate, and you put it in. Uh, I got some. I went to the health food store, and they had it. And I put two, three, four drops in some warm water and a spray thing. I got in, you know, a spray thing. And I went out there, and I went like that. And the whole tone changed. They went, and, and you could see them. They were all like, ugh, ugh. <laughs> But they kept at it because the, the mites were overpowering and everything. But then, um, so I sprayed for, I just sprayed the plants for a couple of days and everything. And the activity diminished. So they came later, stayed long, didn't stay as long, left, and after about three and a half days, they were gone. And so there's natural ways that you can deter things. Or I could have just let it go. You know, so I and the thing that was I was really mad at myself about is I didn't film it, so I don't have it on camera. You know, so but um, but maybe they'll come back next year. Anyway, so that's just the kind of ecological stories I t I can tell, that are kind of fun, but scary sometimes. You know, so. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Thank you.